UFOs and Aliens, an Orthodox Christian Understanding by Father Seraphim Rose. Introduction, an excerpt from Father Seraphim Rose, His Life and Works by Hieromonk Damascene. For Chapter 6 of Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future, titled Signs from Heaven, an Orthodox Christian Understanding of UFOs, Father Seraphim researched a great many books works by reputable scientists and historians, as well as some popular works which gave him insights into the mind of the times. His library in the Optina cell even included the books Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Star Wars. At the beginning of the chapter, Father Seraphim looked into the background of science fiction literature in order to characterize the mentality associated with UFOs. He then proceeded to the objective evidence for UFO phenomena, quoting scientists he had studied and discussing the official government reports. He chronologically traced the history of UFO sightings in the 20th century, defined the various kinds of UFO encounters, and related in detail some of the more reliable, well-documented, and revealing cases. About close encounters of the third kind, cases of actual contact with animated beings, he wrote. Science fiction has given the images, evolution has produced the philosophy, and the technology of the space age has supplied the plausibility for such encounters. Having demonstrated that there can be no reasonable doubt that there is something behind the many thousands of serious UFO reports, Father Seraphim went on to present his conclusions based on patristic sources. These conclusions, as it turned out, were being corroborated by the secular scientists themselves. Only lately, Father Seraphim wrote, have serious investigators begun to agree that UFOs, while having certain physical characteristics, cannot at all be explained as somebody's spaceships, but are clearly something of the paraphysical or occult realm. He quoted the French astrophysicist Jacques Vallée as saying that UFOs might be constructed both as physical craft and as psychic devices. Dr. Vallée has well asked whether the sightings might not be carefully engineered scenes and whether the visitors from outer space idea might not serve as a diversionary role in masking the real, infinitely more complex nature of the technology that gives rise to the sightings. Both he and Dr. J. Allen Hynek, the chief scientific consultant of the Air Force investigations of UFOs, had advanced the theory of Earth-bound aliens, speculating on interlocking universes right here on Earth from which the phenomenon might be coming. In the words of Iowa College professor Brad Steiger, who had made a detailed study of the Air Force files, we are dealing with a multidimensional paraphysical phenomena which is largely indigenous to planet Earth. Excerpt from Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future by Father Seraphim Rose, Chapter 6, Signs from Heaven, an Orthodox Christian Understanding of Unidentified Flying Objects. The most puzzling aspect of UFO phenomena to most researchers namely the strange mingling of physical and psychic characteristics in them, is no puzzle at all to readers of orthodox spiritual books, especially the lives of saints. Demons also have physical bodies, although the matter in them is of such subtlety that it cannot be perceived by men unless their spiritual doors of perception are opened, whether with God's will, as in the case of holy men, or against it, as in the case of sorcerers and mediums. Orthodox literature has many examples of demonic manifestations which fit precisely the UFO pattern. Apparitions of solid beings and objects, whether demons themselves or their illusionary creations, which suddenly materialize and dematerialize, always with the aim of awing and confusing people and ultimately leading them to perdition. The lives of the 4th century St. Anthony the Great and the 3rd century St. Cyprian the former sorcerer are filled with such incidents. The life of St. Martin of Tours by his disciple Sulpicius Severus 
has an interesting example of demonic power in connection with a strange physical manifestation which closely parallels today's UFO close encounters. A certain youth named Anatolius became a monk near St. Martin's Monastery, but out of false humility he became the victim of demonic deception. He fancied that he conversed with angels, and in order to persuade others of his sanctity, these angels agreed to give him a shining robe from out of heaven as a sign of the power of God that dwelt in the youth. One night, about midnight, there was a tremendous thudding of dancing feet and a murmuring as of many voices in the hermitage, and Anatolia's cell became ablaze with light. Then came silence, and the deceived one emerged from his cell with the heavenly garment. A light was brought, and all carefully inspected the garment. It was exceedingly soft, with a surpassing luster, and of a bright scarlet, but it was impossible to tell the nature of the material. At the same time, under the most exact scrutiny of eyes and fingers, it seemed to be a garment, and nothing else. The following morning, Anatolia's spiritual father took him by the hand in order to lead him to St. Martin to discover whether this was actually a trick of the devil. In fear, the deceived one refused to go, and when he was being forced to go against his will, between the hands of those who were dragging him the garment disappeared. The author of the account, who either witnessed the incident himself or had it from eyewitnesses, concludes that, the devil was unable to keep up his illusions or conceal their nature when they were to be submitted to Martin's eyes. It was so fully within his power to see the devil that he recognized him under any form, whether he kept to his own character or changed himself into any of the various shapes of spiritual wickedness, including the form of pagan gods and the appearance of Christ himself, with royal robes and crown and enveloped in a bright red light. It is clear that the manifestations of today's flying saucers are quite within the technology of demons. Indeed, nothing else can explain them as well. The multifarious demonic deceptions of Orthodox literature have been adapted to the mythology of outer space, nothing more. The Anatolius mentioned above would be known today simply as a contactee. And the purpose of the unidentified object in such accounts is clear to awe the beholders with a sense of the mysterious, and to produce proof of the higher intelligences, angels, if the victims believe in them, or space visitors for modern men, and thereby to gain trust for the message they wish to communicate. We shall look at this message below. A demonic kidnapping quite close to UFO abductions is described in the life of St. Nihilus of Sora, the 15th century founder of Skeet Life in Russia. Some time after the saint's death, there lived in his monastery a certain priest with his son. Once, when the boy was sent on some errand, suddenly there came to him a certain strange man who seized him and carried him, as if on the wind, into an impenetrable forest, bringing him to a large room in his dwelling and placing him in the middle of his cabin, in front of the window. When the priest and the monks prayed for St. Nihilus' help in finding the lost boy, the saint came to the boy's aid and stood before the room where the boy was standing, and when he struck the window frame with his staff, the building was shaken and all the unclean spirits fell to the earth. The saint told the demon to return the boy to the place from which he had taken him, and then became invisible. Then, after some howling among the demons, the same strange one seized the boy and brought him to the skeet like the wind, and placing him on a haystack, he became invisible. After being seen by the monks, the boy told them everything that happened to him, what he had seen and heard, and from that time this boy became very humble, as if he had been stupefied. The priest, out of terror, left the skeet with his son. In a similar demonic kidnapping in 19th century Russia, a young man, after his mother cursed him, became the slave of a demon grandfather for twelve years and was capable of appearing invisibly among men in order to help the demon sow confusion in their midst. Such true stories of demonic activity were commonplace in earlier centuries. It is a sign of the spiritual crisis of today that modern men, 
for all their proud enlightenment and wisdom, are becoming once more aware of such experiences, but no longer have the Christian framework with which to explain them. Contemporary UFO researchers, seeking an explanation of phenomena which have become too noticeable to overlook any longer, have joined today's psychic researchers in an attempt to formulate a unified field theory that will encompass psychic as well as physical phenomena. But such researchers only continue the approach of enlightened modern men and trust their scientific observations to give answers in a spiritual realm that cannot be approached objectively at all, but only with faith. The physical world is morally neutral and may be known relatively well by an objective observer. But the invisible spiritual realm comprises beings both good and evil, and the objective observer has no means of distinguishing one from the other unless he accepts the revelation which the invisible God has made of them to man. Thus, today's UFO researchers place the divine inspiration of the Bible on the same level as the satanically inspired automatic writing of spiritism, and they do not distinguish between the actions of angels and those of demons. They know now, after a long period when materialistic prejudices reigned among scientists, that there is a non-physical realm that is real, and they see its effects in UFO phenomena. But as long as they approach this realm scientifically, they will be just as easily deceived by the unseen powers as the most naive contactee. When they try to determine who or what is behind the UFO phenomena and what the purpose of the phenomena might be, they are forced to indulge in the wildest speculations. Thus, Dr. Vali confesses himself baffled whether the source of UFO manifestations might be a morally neutral, unattended clockwork, a benevolent, solemn gathering of wise men, as the extraterrestrial myth would have us believe, or a terrible superhuman monstrosity, the very contemplation of which would make a man insane, that is, the activity of demons. A true evaluation of the UFO experience may be made only on the basis of Christian revelation and experience, and is accessible only to the humble Christian believer who trusts these sources. To be sure, it is not given to man entirely to explain the invisible world of angels and demons, but enough Christian knowledge has been given to us to know how these beings act in our world and how we should respond to their actions, particularly in escaping the nets of the demons. UFO researchers have come to the conclusion that the phenomena they have studied are essentially identical with phenomena that used to be called demonic. But only the Christian the Orthodox Christian, who is enlightened by the patristic understanding of Scripture and the 2,000-year experience of saints' encounters with invisible beings, is able to know the full meaning of this conclusion. Section 5. The Meaning of UFOs What, then, is the meaning of the UFO phenomena of our time? Why have they appeared just at this time in history? What is their message? To what future do they point? First, UFO phenomena are but one part of an astonishing outpouring of paranormal events, what just a few years ago most people would have considered as miracles. Dr. Vali, in The Invisible College, expresses the secular appreciation of this fact. Observations of unseen events suddenly loom into our environment by the thousands causing a general shifting of man's belief patterns, his entire relationship to the concept of the invisible. Something is happening to human consciousness. The same powerful force that has influenced the human race in the past is again influencing it now. In Christian language, this means a new demonic outpouring is being loosed upon mankind. In the Christian apocalyptic view, see the end of this book, we can see that the power which until now has restrained the final and most terrible manifestation of demonic activity on earth has been taken away, 2 Thessalonians 2.7. Orthodox Christian government and public order, whose chief representative on earth was the Orthodox emperor, 
and the Orthodox Christian worldview no longer exist as a whole, and Satan has been loosed out of his prison, where he was kept by the grace of the Church of Christ, in order to deceive the nations and prepare them to worship Antichrist at the end of the age. Perhaps never since the beginning of the Christian era have demons appeared so openly and extensively as today. The visitors from outer space theory is but one of the many pretexts they are using to gain acceptance for the idea that higher beings are now to take charge of the destiny of mankind. Footnote. Many of the reports of Bigfoot and other monsters show the same occult characteristics as UFO sightings, and often they occur in connection with such sightings. Second, UFOs are but the newest of the mediumistic techniques by which the devil gains initiates into his occult realm. They are the terrible sign that man has become susceptible to demonic influence as never before in the Christian era. In the 19th century, it was usually necessary to seek out dark seance rooms in order to enter into contact with demons. But now one need only look into the sky, usually at night, it is true. Mankind has lost what remains of basic Christian understanding up to now, and now passively places himself at the disposal of whatever powers may descend from the sky. The new film, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, is a shocking revelation of how superstitious post-Christian man has become ready in an instant and unquestioningly to believe and follow hardly disguised demons wherever they might lead. Footnote. Two other recently discovered paranormal phenomena reveal how boldly the demons are now making use of physical means, in particular, modern technical devices, in order to enter into contact with men. 1. One Latvian researcher, now followed by others, has discovered the phenomenon of mysterious voices which appear unexplainably on tape recorders, even when the recording is done under clinical conditions in a totally soundless atmosphere, with results very similar to those of seances. The presence of a medium or psychic in the room seems to help the phenomenon. Konstantin Raudiv, Breakthrough, An Amazing Experiment in Electronic Communication with the Dead. 2. Metallic-voiced space people for some time have supposedly been using the telephone to communicate with both contactees and UFO researchers. The possibility of a hoax in such a phenomenon, of course, is high. But in recent years, the voices of the dead, convincing to those who are contacted, have been heard in telephone conversations with their loved ones. It can hardly be denied, as the reporter of this phenomenon notes that the demons of old are marching among us again, to a degree unheard of in the past. Keel, UFOs, Operation Trojan Horse. Third, the message of the UFOs is, prepare for Antichrist. The savior of the apostate world is coming to rule it. Perhaps he himself will come in the air in order to complete his impersonation of Christ. Perhaps only the visitors from outer space will land publicly in order to offer cosmic worship of their master. Perhaps the fire from heaven, Apocalypse 13.13, 13, will be only a part of the great demonic spectacles of the last times. At any rate, the message for contemporary mankind is, expect deliverance, not from the Christian revelation and faith in an unseen God, but from vehicles in the sky. It is one of the signs of the last times that there shall be terrors and great signs from heaven. Even a hundred years ago, Bishop Ignatius Brianchininov, in his book On Miracles and Signs, remarked on the striving to be encountered in contemporary Christian society to see miracles and even perform miracles. Such a striving reveals the self-deception, founded on self-esteem and vain glory, that dwells in the soul and possesses it. True wonder-workers have decreased and grown extinct, but people thirst for miracles more than ever before. We are gradually coming near to the time when a vast arena is to be opened up for numerous and striking false miracles, 
to draw to perdition those unfortunate offspring of fleshly wisdom who will be seduced and deceived by these miracles. Of special interest to UFO investigators, the miracles of Antichrist will be chiefly manifested in the aerial realm, where Satan chiefly has his dominion. The signs will act most of all on the sense of sight, charming and deceiving it. St. John the Theologian, beholding in Revelation the events that are to precede the end of the world, says that Antichrist will perform great signs and will even make fire to come down out of heaven upon the earth in the sight of men. This is the sign indicated by Scripture as the highest of the signs of Antichrist, and the place of this sign is the air. It will be a splendid and terrible spectacle. St. Simeon the New Theologian for this reason remarks that the struggler of prayer should quite rarely look into the sky out of fear of evil spirits in the air, who cause many and various deceptions in the air. St. Ignatius Briancheninov continues, Men will not understand that the miracles of Antichrist have no good, rational purpose, no definite meaning, that they are foreign to truth, filled with lies, that they are monstrous, malicious, meaningless play-acting, which increases in order to astonish, to reduce to perplexity and oblivion, to deceive, to seduce, to attract by the fascination of a pompous, empty, stupid effect. All demonic manifestations have the characteristic that even the slightest heed paid to them is dangerous. For such heedfulness alone, allowed even without sympathy for the manifestation, one may be sealed with a most harmful impression and subjected to a serious temptation. Thousands of UFO contactees and even simple witnesses have experienced the dreadful truth of these words. Few have escaped once they become deeply involved. Even the secular investigators of UFO phenomena have seen fit to warn people against their dangers. John Keel, for example, writes, Dabbling with UFOs can be as dangerous as dabbling with black magic. The phenomenon preys upon the neurotic, the gullible, and the immature. Paranoid schizophrenia, demonomania, and even suicide can result, and has resulted in a number of cases. A mild curiosity about UFOs can turn into a destructive obsession. For this reason, I strongly recommend that parents forbid their children from becoming involved. School teachers and other adults should not encourage teenagers to take an interest in this subject. UFOs, Operation Trojan Horse. In a different place, Bishop Ignatius Briancheninov recorded with awe and foreboding the vision of a simple Russian blacksmith in a village near Petersburg at the dawn of our present age of unbelief and revolution, 1817. In the middle of the day, he suddenly saw a multitude of demons in human form, sitting in the branches of the forest trees, in strange garments and pointed caps, and singing, to the accompaniment of unbelievably weird musical instruments, an eerie and frightful song. Our years have come, our will be done. We live near the end of this fearful age of demonic triumph and rejoicing, where the eerie humanoids, another of the masks of the demons, have become visible to thousands of people, and by their absurd encounters take possession of the souls of those men from whom God's grace has departed. The UFO phenomenon is a sign to Orthodox Christians to walk all the more cautiously and soberly on the path to salvation, knowing that we can be tempted and seduced not merely by false religions, but even by seemingly physical objects which just catch the eye. In earlier centuries, Christians were very cautious about strange and new phenomena, knowing of the devil's wiles. But after the modern age of enlightenment, most people have become merely curious about such things and even pursue them, relegating the devil to a half-imaginary realm. Awareness of the nature of UFOs, then, can be a help in awakening Orthodox Christians to a conscious spiritual life and a conscious Orthodox worldview that does not easily follow after the fashionable ideas of the times. The conscious Orthodox Christian lives in a world that is clearly fallen, both the earth below and the stars above, 
all being equally far from the lost paradise for which he is striving. He is part of a suffering mankind, all descended from the one Adam, the first man, and all alike in need of the redemption offered freely by the Son of God by his saving sacrifice on the cross. He knows that man is not to evolve into something higher, nor has he any reason to believe that there are highly evolved beings on other planets. But he knows well that there are indeed advanced intelligences in the universe besides himself. These are of two kinds, and he strives to live so as to dwell with those who serve God, the angels, and avoid contact with the others who have rejected God and strive in their envy and malice to draw man into their misfortune, the demons. He knows that man, out of self-love and weakness, is easily inclined to follow error and believe in fairy tales that promise contact with a higher state or higher beings without the struggle of Christian life. In fact, precisely as an escape from the struggle of Christian life. He distrusts his own ability to see through the deceptions of the demons, and therefore clings all the more firmly to the scriptural and patristic guidelines which the Church of Christ provides for his life. Such a one has the possibility to resist the religion of the future, the religion of Antichrist, in whatever form it may present itself. The rest of mankind, saved by a miracle of God, is lost. The following is an excerpt from the original recording of Father Seraphim's lecture from 1982 titled, Living the Orthodox Worldview. Another point, the truly weird response to the new movie everyone in America is talking about and seeing, E.T., the extraterrestrial, has caused literally millions of seemingly normal people to express their affection and love for the hero who is a savior from outer space who is quite obviously a demon. And all this is an obvious preparation for the worship of the coming Antichrist. And today, the movie editor is a, is a review of the new Orthodox America of this film, which can be sure all read. It is also a review of this film in the recent uh, newspaper, The Greek Archdiocese. And the, a priest who reviewed it is a wonderful movie that can teach us about love and everything to see it. It means that there is quite a contrast between people who are trying to be aware of what's going on and those who are simply led into the mood of the times. I could go on with details like this, but my purpose is not to frighten you, but to make you aware of what is happening around us. It is truly later than we think. The apocalypse is now. Now tragic it is to see Christians, and above all, Orthodox young people, with this incalculable tragedy hanging over their heads, who think they can continue what is called a normal life in these terrible times, participating fully in the whims of this silly, self-worshipping generation, totally unaware that the fool's paradise we are living in is about to crash and completely unprepared for the desperate times that lie just ahead of us. There is no longer even a question of being a good or a poor or to last rich. The question now is, will our faith survive at all? With many, it will not survive. The coming Antichrist will be too attractive, too much in the spirit of the worldly things we now crave, for most men even to know that they have lost their Christianity by bowing down to him. Still, the call of Christ comes to us. Let us, after becoming aware of some of these things, begin at last to pay attention to it. Father Seraphim Rose writes, Orthodox Christians, hold fast to the grace which you have. Never let it become a matter of habit. Never measure it by merely human standards or expect it to be logical or comprehensible to those who understand nothing higher than what is human, or who think to obtain the grace of the Holy Spirit in some other way than that which the one Church of Christ has handed down to us. True orthodoxy, by its very nature, must seem totally out of place in these demonic times, a dwindling minority of the despised and foolish, in the midst of a religious revival inspired by another kind of spirit. But let us take comfort from the certain words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Let all true Orthodox Christians strengthen themselves for the battle ahead, never forgetting that in Christ the victory is already ours. He has promised that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church, 
and that for the sake of the elect he will cut short the days of the last great tribulation. And in truth, if God be for us, who can be against us? Even in the midst of the cruelest temptations, we are commanded to be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let us live, even as true Christians of all times have lived, in expectation of the end of all things, and the coming of our dear Savior. For he that giveth testimony of these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.